Hi, I'm Brad Hemminger. Um, I'm a faculty member at SILS. I've been here sorry, uh, since 2000. Um, before that, I was a research scientist in the School of Medicine. And my background is in information and computer science. Um, and I'm going to follow Brian's lead because telling stories, I think, is a great way to engage you and uh, rem help you remember some of the things. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the areas that I do research in um, and do it by storytelling. Um, so when I first got here, I was a new teacher teaching for the first time, and I wanted my course materials to be freely available, easily accessible to all my students. Um, and so I had them assigned many readings, including a, a couple of, of my research papers. Um, and I thought, how can I make them accessible to everybody? So I, I wanted to have them as an, like an electronic resource, and I went and talked to a librarian since I was in a library school now. And she sent me to the e-resources library, and she said she'd be happy to help, but they had to license it from the publisher, and they could do that. It would only cost the university about $1,500. I thought, this is crazy. I wrote the paper. Why can't we use it? Um, I had done the work. NIH, the National Institutes of Health, had a grant that had funded the work. UNC had supported it. The peer review was done by my you know, colleagues in, the, in academia around the world, all for free. Um, I'd previously given out print copies of my papers for free. Why were we having to pay all this money? So that was my first taste of some of the problems in the kind of area of scholarly communications. And I've kind of had a taste for that ever since. That's one of my main research areas. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a, a few of the areas that my research touches on within kind of scholarly communications. And by the way, I did rebel. I put up a, a server on the internet and loaded the PDF of my paper online so that all my students or anyone could access it. And I continued to rebel by always having all of my publications online on my homepage for easy access. Although I admit last year I did have to abide by a takedown request uh, to take one of them off. So I'm mostly rebelling. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few areas. So the first one I wanna talk about is electronic theses and dissertations. This is an area that many universities uh, try to change their practice to go from having print versions of theses and dissertations to digital ones. Um, and it's sort of a low hanging fruit. It's an easy thing to try to convert if you're into this idea of making scholarly communications uh, with you know less of a barrier, more easy access. Um, so the first thing I did at SILS was to put all the master's papers online, try to make them searchable and indexed by Google. Before that, they, they weren't. They were just up there and people would go, uh, get a copy of the print ones. Um, I don't see you guys, so I can't see your reactions, but I, I always ask like, you know, take a guess how many people go look at your printed bound master's paper that you produce. And the answer is usually about one to two people. You and maybe your mom when that your parents come for your graduation. Um, but nobody else ever looks at it, the print one. And so when we made them electronic uh, and accessible, then all of a sudden a lot of people would look at them. Um, and the very first night, I actually put it when we went live, my student was helping me. Uh, we put it up live and uh, uh, that same student uh, called me up at like 11 at night and said, hey, it's so exciting. Uh, I just got an email from someone in Australia who's doing their dissertation. They referenced my master's paper and said it was, they were so happy they found it because that's what they wanted to do their dissertation on and they realized it had already been done. And so they would take a little bit different bent on that topic. Um, but she was excited that someone was engaged with her research. That had never happened before until we put them up online, made them searchable. Um, so today, your theses and people's dissertations on campus are all electronic and that's a requirement. It only took us about seven years to get that accomplished at UNC. I've learned how slow bureaucracy works. Um, but good things do happen with time. Um, I don't see a screen uh, amount of time yet, Susan, so if you can, I'm not sure why I'm seeing like a UNC thank you thing on my screen, just so you know. 
Um, the second thing I'll talk about is the serials crisis and open access. Some of you may know what the serials crisis is. It's the cost of journal publications and they're going up at a rate of like an ex exponential rate. I'll get my hand like this and your library budgets are flat like this or declining and that's a problem. So we can't afford to keep buying all these uh, uh, journals. Now, are all the publishers, we talk about the evil Elseviers and fo folks like that, are all these publishers bad? Well, not really. Um, it used to be there were lots of small ones and they weren't making enough money and they were struggling to survive. And what did they do? They tried to standardize their process. They merged together so they could survive. They did what any business would do. Um, but what happened was when they got really good at that, optimizing it, and they reduced themselves down from hundreds and hundreds of publishers to just a handful, uh, they got a little too good and they sort of have a monopoly now because there's only one science journal or one nature journal. Um, and so the solution that's been sort of arrived at for that is uh, what we call open access, and that's to make publications open and freely available. And that addresses that problem I talked about the very first part of uh, of my talk. And so that's a good thing. Um, the trouble is there's still cost in producing something, right? Um, with electronic and digital technologies, we can reduce a lot of the cost. The, we don't make a print version. Um, it's much easier to format and produce the, uh, the article, but still somebody has to peer review it, right? Somebody has to copy edit it. So there's some cost involved. And so who covers those costs? Well, the primary business model that's evolved for open access is called um, kind of author pays and so the author now pays a fee to publish in a journal. Well, maybe that's not so perfect, right? Um, what's the problem with that? What if uh, Susan wants to publish in Nature, but she can't afford the author fee, but I, I've got this, I'm rich or something and I can afford it. All of a sudden we've introduced some bias into this, so that's an issue. Um, and that's led to things like predatory publishing. You can, uh, if you Google that, you'll see where uh, these we have now journals that have been created and they're not really journals, but they just try to take advantage of unknowing authors to get them to pay the fees to publish in that journal because there's so much demand where people need to get published in order to get tenure. Um, I'm going to talk about the big deals. You may have heard that term. Big deals is the way these publishers sell their journals. So they have large collections and they've bundled them into these packages. It's a lot like your cable TV subscriptions. Um, and so the advantage was you got tons and tons of awesome journal titles at reduced rates by buying these packages. But once you have these monopolies, they would just keep right raising the price of the bundle. And so they kept going up and up and uh, we couldn't afford them. And so I want to say, I want to call out UNC for recently, two years ago, breaking a deal with Wiley and Elsevier this year. Um, and we were excited to be able to be part of that. Um, what we did was to help do a financial model, kind of an analytics thing to show them how they could save dollars, have a different way to do it by getting things through open access and through interlibrary loan. And we helped uh, get a company, uh, one of my former doctoral students, uh, uh, create a tool called Unsub to allow uh, libraries to, to calculate this financial cost and figure out how to more uh, cost effectively do this. And so a lot of universities are now breaking their deals, their big deals. We'll see with the Elsevier's and the Wiley's and folks like that. Um, I'm going to just do one last one. I'm going to talk about altmetrics. Um, if you don't haven't heard the term altmetrics, it's about trying to understand the value or the impact of uh, scholarly work. And so that's traditionally been done in this field by citation analysis. So if you've published something, we look at how many citations of your work have over a certain window of time. Um, but that's just one measure. In today's world, there's a lot of different ways that scholars uh, share their content or learn about it, access it and use it. And so our idea was to kind of expand just from citations, but to look at all the ways that scholars work uh, with material and one of the nice things is that it's mostly all digital and they leave traces and so we call these digital traces and then we can look at these to see um, how scholars are being talked about say in Twitter or in blog posts or in the news and so we developed this uh, Altmetrics was coined actually in my office with uh, Jason Prem one of my doctoral students who uh, 
uh, started the company that's now called um, R Research. And uh, I just want to say a lot of great things get created here at SILS. That's one of them. Um, and if you have an interest in scholarly communications, uh, come talk to me. It's one of my passions. And I'll leave you with a question as I go. Who's the most famous person in my family? And it's not me. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody.